The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery for another action-packed adventure. That's right. <laughs> You know, it's strange. Uh, so, do you see that the Finnish uh, skier in the Olympics? No, what happened? He froze his penis. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's all over the papers. It's all over the news. It's just this is a good way to start the show. Oh, I know because it's it. You know, yeah. we got the, well. This this connects to the show. This is you know, I've always got some sort of motive, don't I? Right. He was wearing pants, right? Yeah, but uh, oh. you know, so it's just strange that. Uh, but he was so badly freezing that he didn't. He kept going because he wanted to uh, win and uh, at any cost. So um, now they have to <laughs> get it working again if it's possible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, so this is a true story. This, 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 so that that's commitment. It is like that's commitment. So would would you do that? Um, no. For the, I no, be that for your book or for the show or anything, you wouldn't. Like, what kind of guy are you? You mean you wouldn't? I, I think I have to draw the line at my junk. <laughs> oh, come on. You know. <laughs> you know, what if they have to amputate? <laughs> well, then you, then you become something different. Something different, that's right. I don't, you know. Get it. it doesn't matter. Know. Yeah, it's all the same, right? I mean, you're getting old, so what difference does it make? No, oh, that's true. You, know. you don't even use it anymore. Come on. <laughs> I mean, what? Birthdays yeah. and Christmas do not count. <laughs> yeah. You just have to come up with something new to do on the holidays. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now this this <laughs> this next guy. Okay, so this guy is a uh, a virgin. That's why we're talking. Um, this, he's <laughs> just done a new book. He's it's, it's his first book. So. Um, we're here to give him a lift and a push. Um, <laughs> and a sacrifice. Yeah, it's, yeah that's, that's halfway through the show. Sacrifice. You see, we've got to do the sacrifice. And we're going to let <laughs> you decide what that is. We're going to let, let the listeners decide what to do. Um, no, so he's with uh, Last Waltz Publishing. Um, and uh, the book is called Monochrome Noir. And uh, all the way from the great uh, Utah, Mr. Jack Wells. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Great Utah, I love that. It's it's that's so misleading, but we'll go with it. Well, these beautiful mountains and sea. Yeah, and, it's and, it's an outdoor lover's paradise for sure. That that much, you know, it, it definitely has some grandeur. The Great Salt Lake. It's not so great anymore. There's not a lot. There's not much of it left. Well, there. Well. <laughs> So I uh, yeah, so I was kind of looking at this um, your book here, and um, and getting into the story somewhat. Um, now now this this is a a story a detective story, and it's set in an alternative version of 1986 Los Angeles. Yep. So you've gone back to the 80s, yep. and now you're saying it's a gray scale world. Yes. And that. Items of color are really rare. So I have to say, so what do items of color represent to you to, to make it the rare part of your book? Well, you know, the whole premise was initially was to write a, a short story for a pulp uh, magazine here in, in Salt Lake. And when I think of pulp, I immediately go to the old noir detective stories, whether it's the movies or the books, you know, and of course the movies – all those classics from the 40s and 50s are all in black and white. And so I kind of wanted to go that route, but so many authors have done that. I mean, there's, there's, there's too many good authors out there to go up against and say, yeah, I'm going to hop into the same kind of category in the same time frame that they were prolific and try to write a story that's already been told a million times, or at least in the, the setting a million times. So, you know, for me, it was like, let's, okay, let's, Let's take that black and white aesthetic of those of those old films and bring them forward a little bit to what some would say arguably the most colorful decade was the 80s. You know, and there's no noir that I can think of taking place in the 80s per se. So I don't know. I just thought, I thought it would be kind of cool to take that aesthetic. And if you've seen anything like by Frank Miller, um, Sin City, you know, where the, the items of color are there to really draw the eye and to really kind of 
put an exclamation point to their importance. And so that's kind of, that was kind of the impetus behind it. Um, and then it just kind of it took off from there, you know, the, the, how cool it would be in this black and white world if things of color could be brought in and what would that mean, you know, and in, in a world where it's, it's black and white and a million shades of gray, if you had something that was red or blue or gold or silver, I mean, that would be beyond stunning. It would be, almost be priceless. And so to me, it was kind of the definition of monetary wealth in this universe. If you have an item of color, you're considered pretty wealthy. So um, in essence, you're saying that the colored items are kind of like gold. Yeah. Uh, they're they're kind of the precious thing that that would give you anything you wanted. Basically, um, yeah. So that that's an interesting idea. So what what if a person's colorblind? That's a good question. And I actually had an interesting question when we did an author reading, you know, where somebody was saying, well, what happens if you know because these these things are you know these things don't have color that we can see, what happens if color is brought in and it's, it's jarring because they don't know any better. You don't have the base palette to work from. So you don't know what, what meshes with what. And so if, if it does br- get, get turned into a colored item, is it garish and terrible? And yeah, sometimes it would be. So for a colorblind person, I guess, man, being at home in this universe would be great. Um, I can't imagine it'd be all that great when things of color start appearing, but at the point in time when this story takes place, they're still pretty rare. There's only a handful of people that can actually bring color out into these items, so it's not very common. How did you get into writing this story? Like, what brought you to this kind of an idea, do you think? Um, I've always wanted to write. Uh, I think most you know, most authors have had it in them since their youth that they've wanted to write stories. Uh, my problem was I was always very good at jotting down ideas and never jotting down an actual book with those ideas. So there was an open casting call, casting, there was an open publishing call a few years ago in the local magazine where they were looking for pulp stories. And I had done a lot of reviews on Goodreads and other websites. And the, the, the editor of that magazine kind of pinged me and said, hey, we'd like to have you in this collection. Do you have anything? And I didn't, but I really wanted to be in there. And I think just having somebody's interest, somebody that I didn't know, a stranger saying, hey, you know, we like how you write. Can you submit something? kind of was was the spark I needed. And from there, again, like I said, what does a pulp story mean to me? You know, that is like an old kind of old-timey detective story. But I, you know, I just basically sat throughout the night, that first night, brainstorming, how can I tell a noir story in a completely different way so that it stands out and so that I hopefully get accepted into this publication? Um, and so that was kind of where it started. And just having the deadline, I think I had three weeks, to get it submitted. And then it needed to be like between 5,000 and 10,000 words, which for some authors is easy. You know, they can do that in, in, in a day. And, you know, for me, that's not so easy. And so it, it, it took some doing, but it was the, it was the spark I needed and it got me there. So I think that was kind of the, 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 the push that I needed to really kind of get going with it. And then once I dreamt it up, I mean, I had the ending already figured out that first night. I had some of the major characters figured out. It just kind of took off from there. What do you consider uh, monochrome noir? Is it um, an alternate history, or is it some other genre? Yeah, it's kind of an alternate history thriller. Um, there is a mystery in it, but I would hesitate to say that it's, it's kind of like a mainline mystery novel. I'm not really trying to drop a bunch of little hints and, and stump the chump until the end of the, ch- of the book. You know, I'm not trying to... And, and I love those kind of mystery novels, but that's not what this is. This is more of an alternate history thriller. Um, very character driven where the mystery is there, but it's kind of in service to the plot. It's not the plot necessarily. When you, when you get this book, book done, um, and now that it's out, um, do you, do you go back to it and look through it and decide that it's all good or did it, you know, cause when, once you complete something, a lot of times you can look back and go, I wished I did this. I wished I did that. Do you have any second thoughts of this book? Uh, not second thoughts necessarily, but I can definitely say that, you know, as you go through it, or, and I can't speak for other authors, but I mean, I've gone through this thing, like it was like a hundred times at least to just to proof it and to read it out loud and make sure it all works. And then even, even now, even reading chapters out loud for our last waltz, we do a little zoom meeting as well for that. I don't, I don't read a couple of them. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that could have been maybe a little better, but for the most part, because it, it, I went back to it so many times, and I had some very good beta readers. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, 
if you read through, you know, and, and with part two coming out, I think it'll kind of be a little more noticeable in part one. Part one's a little rougher. Um, and that was almost by design because when I was submitting it into this publication, it was going to just be a short story. And I wanted it to feel very, very gritty. Um, but then as a novel, taking that concept and expanding it to a novel, that gritty tone I didn't think would really work throughout like 200,000 pages. I'm like, okay, that's going to get a little tiresome. So I kind of veer away from it as I, as I go, but a little bit of that, that grittiness is still there in part one. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to change that. You know, it, 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 I can look back at it and go, yeah, here's where I was. And here's where I am now. Yeah. It's, it's strange how that, uh, I'm always rewriting, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's a trap though, right? Cause it's, I yeah, mean, it's terrible. Cause, yeah, because you can look back at it a month later and go, "Oh, I want to change that." And then a month later, you change it back to what it was before. It's yeah. At, po- at some point in time, it, it's it, as hard as it is. We just have to walk away from it. Yeah, it's the worst thing in the world to do is to go back and try to fix it or change it. Yeah, um, you know, it's over. It's done. Now, um, the the main character in this book, um, how would you describe him? And is that is that person sort of acting out on you or your your thoughts or is this something that maybe you'd like to be um yeah you know what to an extent i mean he's got my sarcasm for sure he's a little more like i one of the reviewers said hard bitten and i love that descriptor you know where life has kind of kind of roughed him up a little bit he had a kind of a rough childhood and it's not that he's necessarily jaded but he's definitely hardened against life a little bit a little hard bitten um but very sarcastic very glib, uh, a little bit of a gallows sense of humor. So, you know, I definitely have those things, but he's certainly more aloof than I could ever be. Um, doesn't have a lot of attachments. Um, you know, he's, his history is kind of vague, you know, and, which is intentional on his part. He kind of likes the loner type. He doesn't really let a lot of people in. Um, so those aspects, not so much, but definitely the sarcasm, definitely the love of whiskey, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, can see myself in that character. Uh, I'd say he's very similar to um, uh, Casablanca, you know, or any, any of Bogart's uh, roles, really. You know, you got kind of not so much tough as nails, but still tough, you know, and, and kind of wise talking, you know, um, every man kind of. That's, that's kind of the vibe I get from him. What about you makes you want to go into this type of a book? Like, I, it's kind of a dark book, right? Yes. Yeah. And so what about you? Um, is is coming out in this book i guess i'm trying to say you know are you putting some dark stuff out there because you have some inside for sure i mean that's you know it's it's interesting that you look back at yourself as you get older and you, you know you, you look at yourself as, as a as a teen or as a young man you know and in my early teens and 20s i was angry and i and i don't really know what i was necessarily angry about you know but i growing up in california where you you had all this exposure to all these other things i mean Back in the 80s and 90s, industrial was huge and metal was huge. And so I always found myself gravitating towards, you know, that kind of music. And toward, I mean, I was reading Stephen King, I think, by age 10, you know. And so I always felt an affinity towards those darker themes. They always just resonated with me more. And not that I was necessarily like a sad kid or I really didn't have any, you know, I didn't have an awful childhood or anything necessarily. I just, but those always spoke to me. So... I think that darkness, it's in- interesting to explore because, you know, I think all, we all have it in us somewhere. You know, we all have a darkness in us. And a lot of, maybe some of us don't acknowledge it or we don't really notice it. But some of us do. You know, we're never perfect people. You know, we've all done some bad things or made bad decisions or hurt people. Maybe not intentionally, but it happened. Um, and I think it's more fun to explore those sides of humanity because, we're all different. And so what makes us tick? What makes this person do this thing where this other person did something else that's equally bad or, or worse, you know, why did he go down that path? What took him down that path? And I think it makes for a more interesting tale. Um, especially if we're going into the noir genre as a whole, because realistically noir is kind of defined by that, that fatalism and that cynicism, you know? So I kind of felt, you know, if you're going to have noir in the title, it definitely kind of needs to go that route and at least adhere to some of those principles. So when you were a teenager, were you like going around McDonald's and putting people's uh, food in the garbage? <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Yeah. No. That's why no. I was stuck around. 
I, I was a kid, though. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the worst they got, I think, was you know me and my friends driving around late at night listening to, to heavy metal or industrial with music with the windows down, shopping at Hot Topic, just acting out in ways that we thought were cool and were edgy. And, you know, you look at it mm. at, as an adult now, and you're like, what were you thinking? You know, you're just acting like an idiot. But that was that was our method. You know, that was our way of acting out without getting violent or without slipping into drugs or alcohol or something like that. So all in all, I was a pretty good kid, but I definitely had a darkness there, and it always appealed to me. Well, I'm wondering, too, uh, coincidence or homage? You have uh, your PI, Henry Hardcastle, and I'm wondering, you know, are, are you taking the last name from the 80s, like Hardcastle and McCormick, or Charlie Grant, who was also the name of uh, a prominent uh, editor and, and writer in the 80s? So Hardcastle, yes. Grant, no. I just I wanted something that... With Charlie, I wanted a single syllable last name. I think it just flowed better. But Hardcastle, for sure. You'll as this. This is going to be a series of four books, and then potentially more outside of that. And as we get further into it, there's a few more homages in there with people's names or locations to just kind of give my nod, you know, to those because it's I owe a lot to those genres, and so I want to put I want to put my love out there, even if it's in a very subtle way. Are you real organized when you write? Are you outlining ahead of time? Oof. Uh, initially, no. And that, I think, kind of contributes to the roughness of part one, where I was kind of just flying by the seat of my pants. And as I, you know, when, when I got accepted into that, that publication, you know, I had three chapters. And it was Henry chapter, another Henry chapter, and then it was the chapter of the killer. Um, and a lot of my beta readers were like, okay, well, where's the rest of it? And I was like, uh, what rest of it? You know, and even though I had an ending in my mind, I didn't really ever contemplate taking it much further. And then I kind of started delving into it more and it really realized that this was kind of a cool story and it could definitely go places. Um, but that whole part one, I was constantly jumping back and forth and adding pieces and then having to go back in a previous chapter and kind of set the seeds for something that happens later. And, uh, it worked, but it was definitely not the most efficient way. And so from then on, from part two on, I, I definitely have a kind of at least a basic outline of where I'm going to go. Um, the story will surprise me sometimes, but at least I know kind of at least what each chapter is going to entail potentially and at least what major things will happen in each part of the story. So it is, there's a basic outline there. A basic outline, and then you fill it in as you go, I guess. Yeah, I, I want the story to be organic, you know, because just because you have an idea on an outline when you start writing, that idea may not flow, and so you need to be adaptable and, and let the story kind of take, it, you know, take you where it wants to go. So what, what's your setting when you're writing? Are you, um, are you sitting in a room with uh, heavy metal playing and... And uh, blood running down the walls, like what's as often as I can. Yes, yeah. Um, it depends because I, you know, so I, I work full time, um, long hours. I have three kids. You know, I'm a single father, so I've got I've got the home responsibilities, which I love. I love being a dad. Uh, my job is great, but it's long hours and it's a long drive to get there. So I don't have a lot of time to write. So I kind of do, like I guess I would call it guerrilla writing, where I, I just make do with what I have. Some nights. I have all the time in the world and I can sit in my room and, and put on some good music and grab a, a glass of whiskey and just write for hours. And other times I might get 10 or 15 minutes and that's all I've got. So I've got to make it count. I do a lot of voice to text on my phone with notes and complete conversations. And then as soon as I get to a place where I can jot them down, I'll, I'll open up the, the, the book and, and I'll, I'll put it, I'll put them in there where they need to go. So you're driving down the highway talking to yourself. Absolutely. And, and recording. <laughs> and then, then you pull over and start writing and then, and yeah. the cops have never picked you up. Not yet, but you know, <laughs> you're still young. So. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, you know, it's just, you know, who knows, who knows what you're doing in there, you know? Um, well, I, do you have to be in a certain mood? Yes. Absolutely. I, I know, like, some writers can just sit down and just go. Like, for them, it's, it just comes naturally, and they can say, okay, I'm going to carve out tonight from 5 to 10, and they write 10,000 words. I, I'm jealous. Um, I'm very much in awe of that ability because, for me, writing is definitely dependent upon the, on the muse. And if, the, if I'm not feeling it, I can't force it. So I can kind of jot down some stuff, but it doesn't come out like I want it, and then I have to go back and really kind of re-edit it, rewrite it. Um, 
give it a lot of love. So yeah, I've definitely got to be feeling it. And then when I'm feeling it, like I need to take advantage of that. And I try if at all possible to, okay, whatever's happening, just hold on. I got to get this down. I got to, I got to write. Hopefully it's at a time and place where I've got no other responsibilities and I can just go, but and not always. Sometimes I got to, I got to make do with what I've got and take copious notes on my phone. Do you have an outcome as in what you want people to take away what, from your writing or think about when they read your book? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, you know, at the end of the day, I think noir, I mean, it's not prevalent. At least I don't, I don't see it as prevalent. I mean, there's still books out there that kind of veer towards it, but it's not common. I kind of want to bring that back a little bit, you know, and, and again, to take that setting out of the traditional, 50s and 60s or 40s, 50s and 60s settings that we're used to and bring it into a decade that I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily correlate with noir, you know, and because the 80s, they were loud and proud and wild and, and it, you know, it, it wasn't a dark time. You know, even in this black and white world, it's not a dark time. It's very much lively. And, um, you know, the music especially is just, it's so energetic. And so, you know, I thought, how cool would it be to kind of try to fit noir into that? And I, you know, for me, it's, I, I write books, at least with this one, I want to write a book that I myself would, would enjoy reading. And I really want readers to come away having a good time. I mean, we all read because we love to read, but I want to make it enjoyable. I want people to laugh. I mean, there's some really funny passages in there. There's really great sarcastic humor in there and, and kind of observations on everyday life that are humorous, even during all this darkness that's taking place. And I really want people to be entertained. You know, not just say, hey, that was a good book. I want them to say, hey, that was a fun book. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, I think humor is good. I mean, I, I try to have it every single day and put it out there, but people don't always take it that way. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, there's some backlash here and there, but I, I primarily do things, hopefully, to get a laugh out of someone. For sure. Even the show, you know. I mean, we, we get some serious things talked about, but and I get to some good questions, but I think... At the end of it, I still want people to smile a few times, right? So. Well, I think that's how we, we kind of come to grips with it, right? I mean, there is darkness, so there's darkness in the book, there's darkness in the world. And sometimes the best way to counter it or to make peace with it is, is to laugh about it, is to laugh it off, or at least bring some levity into the situation so it's not so glum. So absolutely, I, yeah, I wholeheartedly believe that. Yeah, do, but do you find you have to be a little bit careful then? Because, you see, you see for me, it's, I, I'm kind of... If anybody knows me, they already know that's what it's at, and I've sort of done this for for over ten years now, and they kind of, I've kind of got a reputation, and um, um, but when you're writing a book and it's your first book and you put it out there, are, are you careful in what kind of humor you're using? Uh, no, I, you know, I, I, it's weird, right? Because I'm ultimately I'm a very shy person. Um, it might not come across that way, but I, I am. I'm not so much a, I'm very much an introvert. I don't put myself out there a lot in any situation, but I have this biting sense of humor. And if you get me in a situation where I'm comfortable, you know, with old friends or I'm at work, especially at work where I, I've kind of been doing this long enough that I, I feel like I, I know what I'm doing and people respect that. So I, I can be myself and I feel it's a natural environment that I can just cut loose. And yeah, I'm not going to, I, I'm not easily offended, and I kind of probably accidentally project that on other people, assuming that they won't be easily offended as well. So I tend to, I tend to throw stuff out there that maybe I shouldn't. And I, even my kids, I think they pick up on that. Some of that, and their sense of humor can be a little more extreme than what the average citizen of Utah might be expecting, you know. But it's just who we are, and I, I don't really want to pull punches in that regard. I want that humor to be, you know, if people get it, they get it. If they don't, okay, I'm sorry you didn't get it. But for those who get it, it will be really funny. You know, they'll really, it'll really resonate with them. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to cut loose with it, you know? Yeah, and I always look at it, it's the intention, right? It's not so much the words or the joke. It's kind of what people are meaning. You can tell when someone says something out of hate. Yeah. Or, you know, meanness. Right? Yeah, no, and there, there's none of that in the book. It's, it's, you know, anything that's said is very much, you know, sarcasm, gallows humor. It's, it's just to be, it's just to be funny. It's, it's, I've got no hate in my body. It, you know, it's, let's just be funny. I can take a joke. Hopefully you can take a joke. I'll make fun of you by all means. Sling it back in, at me and make fun of me. I, you know, cause there's probably things that absolutely I deserve to be made fun of and I can certainly take it. Cause that mentality is if you're going to be dishing, dishing it out, then I sure hope you can take it, you know? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> I can take it. Bring the whips. We're out. in good company. All right. Yeah, get, get the whips out. In this book itself, and when you're writing noir, like I'm, a lot of nights I listen to the old um, noirs on on my uh, radio. You yeah, know, I'm getting I'm getting old now, so I, uh, um, so I listen to a lot of those because I don't know, and I, I especially like the ones like Dick Powell, ones with a lot of humor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of almost sly and stuff. Yeah. Um, and and I and I and I get that. So, are, but are you writing these books in that sort of format? So it's like a play almost. You know, honestly, it's almost like a screenplay, and I and I think that's kind of the default for most authors, right? I think that's our our next level of success outside of publishing a book and getting readers is to hey, wouldn't it be cool if this is a movie? Hey, wouldn't it be cool if this is a miniseries? You know, and and I'm certainly in that boat as well. So I write it almost um, in a screen. It doesn't read as a screenplay, but it certainly could. Um, the, the the sentences are shorter and punchier than I think a lot of indie authors go for. Uh, the, the the dialogue is certainly more realistic, um, what people would actually say versus what they would say in a book. Um, as, as, and then that's difficult because, you know, with an editorial process, you know, the editing process, they're always like, uh, that doesn't work. It's, but that's not, but that's how people talk, you know? And so it's this guy, kind of this push pull. Um, but in my mind, it's, it's like a HBO miniseries, you know, where you can get away with that kind of humor, where you can get away with some of the more adult themes and the violence and, and stuff, because that's all in there. And, you know, so in, in my head, yeah, it's very, it's very, um, screenplay oriented, you know, certainly would, would make a great series. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. No, I, I, I like that, but, um, uh, you know, who am I? Um, <laughs> well, you're how, how important <laughs> is the writing to you? Like in, and your writing, is it, how would you consider that? Is that like a really important thing for you? Yes. Uh, it's vitally important. So would you would you let your penis be frozen for this? You know, I mean, sacrifices <laughs> must be made. So <laughs> you know, we all got to bleed for our art. That's kind of uh, I don't know. That'd be an interesting way to bleed, but I don't know. You know, it's, <laughs> I've been wanting to do this for so long. Who's to say? Oh, I because I've been wanting to freeze it for so long. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, well, there uh, you go. Yeah, everybody's got a dream, right? No, I. It's vitally important. I. I don't ever want to slip into the realm of purple prose because I, as, as beautiful as it can be, and, and in certain books, it certainly elevates the story. But there's a lot of books where I've read very flowery and, and beautiful, beautiful prose, but it just doesn't work with the story that's being told. And it almost kind of takes you out of the, the mindset of the, of the story. You're, you're no longer lost in the narrative. Now you're just reading a beautiful book. And I want to get lost in that narrative. Um, so my writing, I kind of tend to go, like I said, towards punchier sentences. Uh, I do like to use big words, but not a lot. And I try to use them in a way that makes sense in the story, where even if you don't know the definition of that word, you'll get the gist of it just by the way it's used. Um, I tend to craft sentences and recraft and recraft and go back and, and change and change and move a, de- move a comma, and shuffle words around to try to get the maximum impact out of it. So when I'm writing... Not only is the writing part difficult, but going back and getting it kind of perfect, I guess. My, my, my definition of perfect is certainly the other side of that coin because I do want people to say, okay, it's a good book and it's fun, but it's very, it's intelligently written too, you know, because that, that is important to me. Hmm. Well, before we veer away from humor, I just wanted to ask you, you know, a lot of times when it comes to, um, uh, you know, performing, uh, something that's that's comical, or whatever. There's there's a need for uh, like comic timing. Right. Do you feel that there's a need to um, have a certain type of timing or rhythm with your writing to uh, to create uh, a, a humorous moment in your story? Yeah, there's you know because with movie you can do slapstick, you can do a lot of uh, sight gags and stuff, and then with books, obviously it's you have to be a little more careful. You, you have to set it up a certain way with the words that you're using. So yeah, there's a lot of um, very precise sentence uh, structure to kind of maximize the impact. There's a little bit of buildup with certain words or phrases or a turn of the conversation will turn a certain way, kind of leading towards that, that, that aha or that haha moment, you know, um, it's, there's an art to it for sure. And I, mm. it, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at it. I starting writing, 
the, the, the scenes and the action and the locations and stuff were the easy part. For me, dialogue was always the hardest. And now I'm kind of getting to this point where it's going the opposite way. Because now I understand these characters and I know these characters so well, I know what they're going to say and how they're going to talk to each other. And so the comedy is kind of becoming easier and easier to write. And now it's everything else that's a little harder, um, you know, coming in coming second place after the dialogue. When you're um, uh, writing, you know, dialogue and stuff, as you were saying, do you have an inner monologue in your head? Can you... Can you hear your, your characters? I just want to know if you hear voices. Oh, I hear voices every day. <laughs> Constantly. Yeah, I do. And that's, I think, one of the things that helps contribute to the dialogue and how I, you know, I think it feels natural. People have told me it feels natural and it's funny because you're having that conversation in your own head or, you're, or even more so you're kind of sitting back and you're watching in your head as your two characters are having this conversation and that, I think, is kind of where the, that timing comes in, too, because you're, you're, as you're listening to them, you're like, okay, I, how do I jot that down in a way that captures that conversation, the energy of that conversation, or the emotion of that, or the humor? Um, so, yes, I hear voices every day, all day long. <laughs> this book never leaves my head. Wow. That's wonderful. Um, <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so wonderful. Well, no. I mean, if they start telling you to do weird things. Right. You know, just approach with caution. In your setting, you know, you're, you've gone from L.A. to um, Salt Lake, and there's a lot of um, Mormon influence there and religion. Has religion influenced your writing? No. I There's a couple things I wanted to stay away from with this book. Cause I, it's one of those things, more so politics and state of the nation than religion per se, but there's certain things that will that will date a book. Um, besides when it's written, obviously, but there's, if you, if you have a lot of references or a lot of, you know, subtle hints that this is really kind of subtext for this, this, this event that happened, I mean, it kind of dates your book in a way, and I don't want that. I, you know, I want this, you know, it's kind of maybe a lofty goal, and it may be kind of, I don't know, a little silly of me to think, think this, but I want it to be timeless. You know, I don't really, even though it's set in 1986, I don't want anybody reading it like, oh, well, that's really, he's really talking about this thing. You know, I don't want to really date it to that. So, no, it's, it's actually doesn't really, cause I'm, cause even though I'm here and I'm surrounded by it, I'm still just, I, I have really no belief whatsoever. I'm kind of just indifferent. So it's, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't really impacted my writing in any way. Although it does get touched on in the book because this ability to bring forth color into the world, you know, some people, you know, view it as magic. Some people view it as, maybe a mutation or whatever, or, you know, as a supernatural ability. And some people view it as divine. You know, it's, 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 it's like maybe this is proof of divinity that this is what the world is, this is what paradise is supposed to look like if everything's colored, you know, if everything has a color to it instead of being black and white. So I touch on it, but I wouldn't say it really influenced me. You're not wearing that funny underwear, are you? No, no, definitely <laughs> <laughs> And no minivans for me. Oh, well. You know, <laughs> too bad, <laughs> too bad, you know. Uh, so what, what influences you, do you think? Um, definitely the, the classics. I love a good mystery, but I, also I love a good thriller. I love to be entertained. I want to be kind of, I want to, I want to see that darker side of the world. You know, I want to see how people react when there's darkness around them, but more than anything else, in this story, at least, I want it to really kind of, what drives me is taking ordinary people and putting them in extraordinary situations. So even though there's people in this world that can do these things, like colorists who can bring color into the world, and there's a few other people that can do some other, you know, I guess you'd call them magical things or supernatural things. They're just ordinary people. You know, they're not superheroes. It's not it's not some gift that they can just use willy-nilly. There's a cost to it, you know, and, and I, I really kind of, that to me is a more engaging tale. If you can take somebody that you can identify with and go, yeah, I know, I know about like that, or I'm kind of like that. How would I react in this situation? You know, knowing that I'm just me, I'm just a normal guy, you know? And so that to me is, is always kind of the driving force is keep the characters grounded, keep them relatable, believable. They're not superheroes. They're not super special. They're just, they're just normal people that get into these situations that are kind of incredible. Well, how do you react to darkness yourself? Like, you know, we, when we look at things like the last couple of years, as we say in America, there's been, um, you could look at it as darkness, whether you right. believe it's conspiracy or whether you believe it's 
well, whatever you're thinking, you know, the world's flat and there's no virus, or you can do all this stuff in your right. head and, and sort it out. Um, but you yourself, so when all this is going on around you, so you're sitting in your home there and you, you've got to write and you're, you're trying to write, um, how much of that will get into what you are writing? Uh, not too much. I mean, you know, I, I mean, you know obviously it's going to touch on some of it. If you look at some of the, the, the subtext behind the story of my book, so Los Angeles is no longer Los Angeles. It's called Angel City. There was a, an act that came through um, Congress or at least the, 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 the state legislature years prior that changed all of the names back to Anglo names, you know, and that was, that was very controversial. And, and, you know, a lot of the, the existing residents of Los Angeles and cities like that were up in arms, which they rightfully should have been, you know? And so, I mean, I guess I could say it definitely impacted me a little bit just to kind of add flavor to the story, but for the most part, I'm kind of a carefree, happy-go-lucky guy. If, it, if, if, it's, if it's something I can affect, if it's something that I can change for the better, then I will try. If it's something that's out of my control, I just I try not to let it worry me too much. I you know, I'm just I'm going to tell the best story I can. I'm going to be the best dad I can, and if that stuff is out there, I'm just going to you know I'll laugh it off if I can, kind of have that humor about it, and just try not to let it affect me because it's not it's not worth getting all up in arms about. When you're done, uh, you know, a chapter for the day or you're writing or you've, uh, you know, you've finished a novel, do you do anything to relax, recharge, or even yes. decompress? Yeah, I, I've got a billion hobbies, you know, so it's one of those kind of like Jack, you know, Jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. I do, I love to shoot. I love to hike, kayak. You know, there's a lot of outdoor stuff you can do in Utah, and so I do most of it. Um, I like me a good glass of whiskey. I like to go sit out by the fire pit with a cigar and just kind of let it go, you know, and because I do get wrapped up in this story. It's, it's never far from my mind. Um, even in my day to day comings and goings, there's always that conversation in the back of my head. Well, what would Henry do in this situation? How would Henry react to this? Well, what would Charlie do? Um, conversations constantly happening. So it is, yeah, there are times when you just have to step away from it and I'll grab a glass of whiskey and a cigar and go sit out by the fire pit and just, just relax and just kind of find that Zen space and just let it go for a while. What would Jesus do? <laughs> what, would you, what would Jesus do indeed? This is well, the you, state to ask that. Well, you keep, uh, you know, you keep mentioning, mentioning whiskey. Yes. Uh, I know right now I'm drinking Knob Creek. Uh, oh, good what, man. What's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite whiskey? So actually, we have High West Distillery. It's it's kind okay. of ironic that um, Utah is home to, in my opinion, one of the better distilleries. Um, it's up in Park City, which is about as far removed as traditional Utah experience as you can get. So I'd say yeah. High West. Um, Blanton's is really good. Blanton's okay. is my yep. book. Um, I like Blanton's. Um, Knob Creek is fantastic. Can't go wrong with that. And honestly... I like this stuff called Alpine, which is also from Park City, where it has kind of these hints of other flavors to it. So it's more of a flavored mm. sipping whiskey, but man, is it good. Interesting. Let's try that. Yeah. No, no Crown Royal. <laughs> <laughs> the Canadian whiskey. Yeah. Canadian yeah. Well, I got some of that too, but no. No, I, I, I like the local stuff. For some reason, Alpine and High West, they're just, even though they're here in Utah, they're amazing. You know, um, when I, uh, it, this is a suggestion, when I uh, met Ronald Melfi, who's written some big books in the horror area, he um, smokes a cigar and drinks whiskey, too, and he looks so good with that cigar. I'm I trying know, to capture that. My yeah. My God. Yeah. And so he's got pictures of him with a cigar. This is what I said to him. Look, you, know, you want to <laughs> capture that bad guy look. And you know what? He does it so well. So it's just a suggestion. You would look so good oh. on on the cover. You know, you got a Thank cigar you. hanging from your mouth. I'm all for it. You know, I would definitely. You know, my it, there was a there was a lot of discussion about the author picture. You know, because it was taken in color, and I said, but the but the world's in black and white. So let's do this black and white picture. I think it has more impact. I would love to do something like that to kind of give it that more that gritty appeal. You know, I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah, hell yeah, I'm gonna look into that. Yeah, you need that. You need that because it has that, you know, energy, the big Sweet. cock energy that people. Right. <laughs> and and it, it gets their eyes looking that way. I'm good with all of that. I love everything that you're saying right now. Well, you see, you know, yeah, that, that, believe me, I could give good advice. Yeah. You know, it's one of the many services you provide. That's right. <laughs> yeah, many. 
<laughs> yeah. <clears throat> anyway, what is it that you think you do that um, people would be surprised about finding out? Me personally or in the book? No, you personally, because that kind of comes out in the book. I think, yeah, I think people will be surprised at just how into heavy metal and like industrial music I still am. You know, I never left, I never quite left the 80s and 90s behind. Um, that's never far from my mind. So, I'm, you know, Megadeth and all these old classic metal bands, I'm still all about them. I'm still all about these old 80s and 90s industrial bands. So I think people would kind of find that uh, kind of surprising since at work, even though I'm confident at work, I don't, you, you don't ever see that. You know, I don't dress like it, I don't really talk like it, but there's always that there. Um, I love to shoot, like, ridiculously amount, ridiculous amount of bullets. I love to go shooting. And even though it's certainly spendier now with the, the cost of ammo, it's still one of my mm. one of my favorite hobbies. I think people would be surprised just how into motorcycles I am. I uh, love to ride. I had to sell my Honda a few years ago, but I think in a year or two I'm going to try to upgrade to a nice blacked-out Harley. Um, I love that open road and that sense of freedom to just look around you and you've got no obstructions whatsoever. There's... There's really no other feeling like it. How do you like the new world? Um, and I mean that in a sense from the 80s and 90s to now. Uh, the biggest difference, of course, is, is the Internet and uh, communication, you know, and, and cell phones and, and how much it's part of our life. Um, and social media is part of that. Right. Um, are, do, do you like interacting in all of those situations? That's a that's a kind of a catch-22 because I – in a way, yes, there's certain aspects about it that I love. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook. For a while there, it was getting really toxic, and I kind of just stayed away from it. But as, a, as an emerging author, there's really no better platform than Facebook. And I have to give a shout-out to, like, the horror community and the indie writing community. They're ridiculously welcoming and the, just the nicest people you'll ever meet. So in that regard, interacting with those folks is fantastic. Um, Instagram's not half bad. I, I stay away from TikTok. I stay away from Twitter. I don't. I don't really have any interest in there. Again, I'm kind of a quiet, introverted kind of guy. Those are really not my platforms. Um, and maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot a little bit with that because that's obviously where a lot of the interest lies for new authors, and they're out there promoting their brand. And I probably won't be. So unless Damon with Last Waltz is out there promoting my stuff, some of that probably won't appear on those on those platforms. But I struggle with it, too, because it also invites a lot of hate. Um, it's easy to sit across the keyboard across the world from somebody and, and sling hate at them, you know, and it's it's kind of a shame that there is so much trolling taking place on these on these platforms because it, it does take the fun out of it, and it, does, it, it really kind of ruins the vibe that people are going for is to connect, not to, not to be angry and hateful at each other. Um, in a way, I kind of miss the simplicity of the 80s and 90s where – you know, you had to know things. You didn't just get to look them up on your phone and have a map show you where it was or, you know, auto dial somebody's number. You had to memorize your friend's number. You had to know addresses. You had to be able to, to give directions and stuff. And I kind of missed that because it forced us to interact more with each other. Um, so that, that's kind of a shame that that's kind of going by the wayside a little bit. I, I do struggle with that a little bit. But I think that's partly why I set my book in 86, too. It, it definitely takes – it you're not you've got this detective who has to do things the old-fashioned way you know and there is no internet he doesn't get to look this stuff up he just has to either know this or he has to know somebody that does and so i think it adds a little more realism to it i think it adds a little more uh tension to it so in that regard i miss it but yeah it's kind of a catch-22 kind of a love-hate with with social media it's weird to like think of my you know as an introvert trying to self-publish this book initially and throw it out there into the world, you know, thinking, Hey, I've got this cool cover and I've got this really cool concept and it's going to make this huge splash and not have it make a splash, you know, cause there's, there's so much content out there. And then to get involved with the horror community and the indie writing community and just how, you know, they welcome me with open arms. They were like, Hey, post your book on my page. Hey, post your book on my site. You know, and it was no thought of what they could get out of it. Just very welcoming. And that's how I met Damon Manx, who you had on your show a few weeks ago was through that social media and that's how we connected. So I, I can't, I can't throw a lot of hate at it, but you know, I do struggle with it from time to time because it's not really my chosen avenue. Well, you know, you just got to kind of um, clean up the, uh, the followers. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's how I do it. <laughs> we um, know. Yep. <laughs> yeah. What well, you do in a way, but you know, actually you would think TikTok and uh, Twitter, you would like better because 
you don't have to interact with people. You can, right. but you can, you can just post. Like you could go on TikTok and do, uh, you have your book and a dog and run around and scream at someone for a minute and post it on there. And that's it. You know, it's not like, um, you're going to have a back and forth with people. Right. It's just, oh, it's a, yeah. Know. Well, no, actually the back and forth and it's like, if it's, if it's an actual candid conversation, like I love that. I absolutely do like social media for that. It's when, so when people start bringing in the outside stuff, the politics or the, you know, the heavy handed opinions, that's where I struggle. But no, I, especially for Facebook, I love the fact that, that readers can hop on there and say, Hey, I just finished your book and I love this, you know, because as a, as a, as a writer, that's what we need to hear. Um, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a shame that so many people, so few people that actually will read a book will actually review it as well. You know, they'll read it. They may love it. They may hate it and you'll never know. And as somebody trying to hone my craft, those reviews and that feedback is vital, you know. And so if I can't get a feedback on, on you know, Amazon or Goodreads, if I can just talk to somebody who read it and say, hey, this part was great or I resonated with this character or I like where you're taking it, that to me is huge. And it, it definitely kind of validates what I'm doing, you know. Hmm. So um, how do you like to connect with people? Are you running a website too now or what, what, where, where can people find you? I think I'm – no, no website currently. I'm, I'm debating on whether I want to do that. I do have the Last Waltz publishing website, my, uh, my publisher, so there is information on there. Typically, for me, it's going to be Facebook, um, Instagram as well, or just straight-up email. Like, you know, if somebody has questions, comments, concerns, I'd love to hear from them. I, that is the part that I really – I'm longing for at this point. I want to talk to the readers. I want to know what works for them and, and what doesn't so that I can become better. Yeah, okay, we'll have everybody, you know, give, give them your worst. Um, <laughs> yeah, bring it. I can take it. Bring it up. <laughs> just, just to inundate them with bad messages, you know. It's like, right, so do, do you have like, like a grinder or a Tinder? Like what's your, what's your handle there? We can give that out. Yeah, yeah. You can hook me up. Yeah, absolutely. I'll throw that to you too, you know. <laughs> Show me so some love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's going to be on there with Cigar. And nothing else. And nothing else. Yep. <laughs> just, just so people know, this is the cigar, a whiskey, and a smile. Yep. That, there you see. You know, you now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. You know. So what's next? You got book two coming up, and um, when do you think that'll be done? And looking like middle of March. Um, we just recently dropped the cover on on Facebook. It's it's a fantastic cover. The artist that does my work is he's a he's one hell of an artist, um, and one hell of a musician too. So it's kind of he's got this. Just this whole lock on creativity. This guy's amazing. But we just dropped the cover, so we're looking probably middle of March for part two. We'll be announcing that shortly. And then Monochrome Noir itself will be four parts total. They will all come out this year. Um, we're going to space them out just a little bit, so we're anticipating that early spring release for two, probably mid-summer for three, and then like early fall, mid-fall for part four. So cover's really important to you. Yes, um, cause we're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but we all do, you know, and, and especially when I went, cause I was going the self-publishing route at first, long before I met Damon and I needed, I felt like I needed something to really stand out, um, on Amazon, you know, cause there's so many books out there and, and there's some fantastic covers out there. And then for a lot of indie authors that maybe can't afford it, there's a lot of covers that just are just okay, you know, and, and I wanted mine to at least stand out a little bit and to give just a hint of what the story might be about, you know, and I think the cover captures it perfectly. So, yeah, very important. Well, it's interesting, really interesting person. So um, we'll have all that information on our website as well so people can find you with one click and uh, abuse you, hopefully. Bring it. And, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, he's really into that. You know, We'd be makes, wanting more. Yep. Yeah, makes his nipples hard. So <laughs> important. It's important to, to, to make authors – Nipples hard. Oh, man, yeah. Top of the oh. list. <laughs> well, another great conversation. And uh, so the publisher, Last Waltz Publisher, um, how do you like publishing this way? So it's fantastic. I, you know, as, as I, as I self-published, you know, again, like I said, you drop, you drop it out there hoping it's going to make this, this big impact and nobody notices it other than family and friends, which were very, very supportive. Um, but it's, it's kind of really kind of rewarding to to communicate with this with Damon who's setting up he's kind of he's branching out on his own he just started his publishing company 
and he's saying, hey, I'm looking for, you know, unique authors with, with these really strong narrative voices. And I said, you know, I'm like, I, I think that's me. Would you care to read my stuff? And to have him, you know, a few days later come back and say, this is fantastic. I want to sign you. I mean, there's no better feeling. You know, it's, is he a big publisher right now? No, he's not. He's just starting out. Will he be? Yeah, I think so. He's got he's got good business sense. He's got the connections. He's got the personality for it. Uh, people love him. His and his own stories that he writes are fantastic. So it's been fantastic to to be a part of that family and to you know he we kind of refer to each other as brothers in arms, you know, because we're looking out for each other. We've got each other's backs. It's it's amazing, and I I consider myself very very fortunate. Well, on that note, we're running out of time. So. Um... Again, the book we were talking about is Monochrome Noir, A Gathering Storm. And the author has been our guest, Jack Wells. So thank you for being on the show. Hey, thank you for having me, and thank you for making my nipples hard. (laughs) (laughs) Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.